My Island Home Written and read by Jim Bentley The moon was bright in the dark blue star-studded sky above our Anna Atoll. Tanu awoke to the gentle splashing of waves. The cool air had disturbed his sleep. It was three o'clock in the morning. Tanu, who recently turned ten, was on a small bed in the living room of his home. His parents, Louisa and Manueli, were in one of the two bedrooms of the weatherboard bungalow. Tano's involuntary action was to feel for his blanket. His body needed cover. But through his drowsiness came the realization that the lapping sounds of the sea were closer than usual. He sat up on the side of his bed. The murkiness in his mind persisted, but he forced himself up and moved in the direction of the kitchen. The atoll-style cookhouse was built apart from the main structure at a slightly lower level. A short walkway provided access. Tanu made his way down the two steps towards the kitchen. To his surprise, he was suddenly ankle-deep in water. The cool sea swirled caressingly around his feet. Stepping down into the cookhouse, he found that the floorboards were about a foot below water level. Now fully alert, Tana was aware that the incoming tide was higher than normal. Their home, about twenty meters from the seashore, was usually above the high water mark, even during spring tides like this. Tanu could feel the thick, wet pandanus mat beneath his feet. Mum will be disappointed, he thought. She had spent days weaving it at the women's club. A bright shaft of moonlight beamed in through the door at the far end of the kitchen. The cupboard, or safe, as Louisa called it, was partially under water. Tanu shuffled to the right side window of the small room. He propped the shutter open with a piece of driftwood that had been there for years. The additional moonlight slightly increased visibility in the room. Opening his mother's cupboard, Tanu reached in and felt for the three large glass containers on the bottom shelf. The encroaching sea had reached them, but they were securely sealed. The family's supply of sugar, rice, and flour was stored in these jars. Carefully, Tanu moved each one to the kitchen shelf. He was pleased to see that the smaller jar of salt was already there. Tanu called to his mother. Louisa was already in the lounge, awakened by the unusual movement in the cookhouse. "'What shall we do, mother?' Tanu asked. "'I shall call your father,' replied Louisa. "'Then we should move all our belongings in the lounge and bedrooms out of water's reach. "'The tide is still coming in and will continue to rise. "'Can you go across to Nana and Pa's place to check on them?' "'Thoughts of great concern rippled through Tanu's young mind. "'He struggled into a printed T-shirt which said, my island home, and stepped out into the swirling tide. The water was almost at waist height, and sand movement was strong. In the moonlight, he could see that debris littered the surface. Small coconuts, leaves, pumice, and driftwood moved in unison with the surging sea. Tanu stubbed his right foot on a large piece of coral, Fortunately, he was not cut. A kawiki crawled across his left foot. He wondered what would happen to these long-legged, sand-colored crabs. Kawikis live in holes in dry sand, 
and move across the beach at great speed. My friends and I have fun bowling them over with baby coconuts. They are nice toasted over charcoal. Perhaps the Kawikis will disappear as the sea and its persistent forces claim our land. The bewildered young islander continued wading towards his grandparents' home, about forty meters away. He reached the front steps. The splashing sea was about eight inches below the floorboards. That is good, thought Tanu. The sea has not penetrated Nana and Pa's house. Tanu climbed carefully to the third step and peered in. Despite the moonlight, he could not see well. The living area seemed dark and cavernous. He moved further into the large room. A strong hand grabbed his wrist. A gruff voice said, Who is it, and what do you want? Tanu called out, It's me, Pa, Tanu. Oi, said Pa, releasing his arm. Tanu, why are you sneaking about? I'm not sneaking, Pa, Tanu said urgently. Mum sent me to check on you and Nana. Our kitchen is flooded, and I came to see if you are all right. The sea has not come into our home yet, said Pa. Our bungalow and kitchen are higher than yours. But it is only a matter of time before it will. I expect that our house will be invaded by the persistent sea during next month's springtide. Nana emerged from the bedroom and hugged Tanu. She said, Tanu, my boy, it is time for you to leave our island home. It is time to make a new life in another country. You need a proper education and a professional job. It is time to abandon the old ways. I would prefer to stay here with Mum and Dad and you and Pa, Tanu said sadly, still clinging to his favorite senior relative. What will happen to our island, Nana, if all of the young people leave? A lump seemed to form in Tanu's throat. Pa broke in and said, You should not worry about our small at all. We will stay and take good care of it for all of our young people. You can visit for holidays whenever you like. Your special home will always be here. The first streaks of dawn appeared in the moonlit sky next to the large yellow moon. The heavy, dark blue of night began to fade. We can expect another blistering hot day, said Pa. We should go fishing early. Nana said, I suppose that Micah the policeman will come around in his aluminium dinghy and take me to the community hall. I would be happier at home. Preparing food over there is not convenient, and taking a nap is difficult. The children make so much noise. Micah is doing his job as our policeman, said Pa. He is worried about your welfare. You could slip and fall and damage your hip. No one would be around to help you. When I am out fishing with Manueli and Tanu, I would feel better if you were at the community hall. I could slip and fall in that wobbly old dinghy Micah has, Nana retorted. He doesn't seem to control it very well. Pa sighed and said, Please go to the hall, my dear. If you argue with me, we won't catch many fish. Tanu went home to have breakfast with his mum and dad. A fire could not be lit in the flooded cookhouse, so it was a cold meal. Leftover fish and breadfruit, followed by green coconut juice. They often had fresh toddy, but after climbing the family coconut tree, Tanu returned with only a small amount. Manueli told him to drink it. 
but Tanu politely declined and gave it to his mother. The coconut trees are not producing much toddy liquid these days, said Manueli. It seems that the abnormally high tides and the long dry spells are adversely affecting them. This will seriously limit a vitamin and mineral intake. As the tide was high, Tanu decided to lay the fishnet directly in front of their home. With one end fastened to a small breadfruit tree, he ran the net out in a broad U-shape, releasing it in folds from his dad's small outrigger canoe. Tanu fastened the other end to a stake in the sand some distance away. Moving to the center of the curved enclosure, he commenced splashing with his paddle to scare the fish into the net. It was then he realized that a five-foot hammerhead shark was within the boundary of the net with him. The menacing gray beast swam at speed back and forth within the floating net barrier. Not able to see a way out, it turned towards the small, low-lying canoe. This shark is very angry and may attack me, thought Tanu. The streamlined creature kept moving towards the outrigger. It was too late to paddle away. The frightened young man raised the paddle above his head. The marauding shark came closer. Tanu swung the wooden weapon with all of his might. The sharp edge of the oar struck the hammerhead directly between the protrusions which support its eyes. Instantaneously, Tanu saw a large white gash. Blood spurted profusely from the threshing body. A broad area of turbulent water turned bright red. Blinded by the blow, the stunned hammerhead swam in the direction of the shore. Manueli was waiting by the kitchen with the reef spear. He drove the single steel spoke through the head of the unsuspecting shark. Manueli gripped the wooden handle tightly and used all of his weight to hold the spearhead in the sand. The strong marine animal threshed wildly in retaliation. Blood spurted in a widening circle. Move quickly ashore, Tanu, Manueli called. Don't waste any time. Go to dry land. Frozen momentarily, Tanu recovered and paddled like he had never paddled before. The struggling hammerhead dislodged the spearhead from the sand. It moved with powerful tail strokes to the direction of the kitchen. Manueli held on to the spear handle firmly and moved rapidly with the enraged shark. He tried to guide the huge fish away from the door, but with considerable force the large creature ended up inside the cookhouse, still struggling and threshing. Manueli pushed on the spear and guided the blood-spurting beast out of the door at the other end of the kitchen. Micah the policeman appeared in the aluminium dinghy. Why are you in there with that shark? he said laughingly. Don't make jokes, said a very serious Manueli. This fellow is dangerous. His blood may attract his brothers. Lift him into the boat, said Micah. Fierce contortions made the shark difficult to control, but the two men managed to place the grey marine creature in the dinghy. Manueli extracted the spear. To his surprise, the hammerhead ceased its powerful writhing. Micah and Manueli laughed in loud relief. Micah sculled the dinghy out to retrieve the fishnet. There weren't any other sharks to contend with. But the fishing gear was heavy. Tano's placing of the net resulted in a large haul of fresh silver trevally. 
After Manuili had shared the catch between his two family homes and put some aside for the policeman, Micah remembered why he had come to this side of the island. Matapule Ioane requests that you all come to the community hall at midday, he said. The seaplane is arriving from the capital island. Five of our people are leaving. All are emigrating. We may never see them again. Please come to say farewell. Our women are already preparing a barbecue fire at the hall, and Reverend Lange brought along several bottles of sweet kamaimai. This shark would be ideal for the occasion. Barbecued with breadfruit, it will go a long way. Manueli opened the hammerhead's belly with a sharp knife and cleaned out its entrails. He saved the liver and roe as a special treat for the passengers. After skinning the shark, its flesh was placed in Micah's dinghy in a plastic icebox. Nana and Pa were deeply sorry when they heard that people were leaving. Nana shed tears of regret, and Tanu tried to comfort her. Pa said, Please get into the dinghy, my dear. I shall hold it steady for you. You go ahead with Micah. The rest of us will wade our way through the high tide to the hall. About fifty atoll citizens were gathered at the community center. The cooking aromas promised a delicious lunch. There was a mound of travel bags and suitcases by the main entrance. The departing islanders were dressed in their Sunday best. They were seated in the center of the hall next to Matapule Ioane and Reverend Langi. The unusually quiet children were seated on a row of benches. The remaining villagers encircled the group. There was sadness in the eyes of everyone present. The atmosphere was one of tense sensitivity. When Reverend Lange rose to say a prayer for those leaving, tears flowed like rain. The sounds of weeping soon overrode Reverend Lange's solemn prayer. Crying turned to deep sobbing. The villagers moved in to hug their departing community members. The reverend cut his prayer short with a loud Amen. Matapule Ioane launched into a serious speech. Ladies and gentlemen, when you leave your small atoll homeland, please remember that your blood links will always be here. Your people will never forget you, and we hope that you will often think of us. Global warming, sea level rise, and climate change are not of our making, and we hope that the people of the industrialized countries that cause these undesirable effects do something about them before our small island home is completely submerged in the sea. Please return to visit your family and friends as often as you can. We will be waiting for you. Before you leave, please enjoy this farewell meal which your atoll relatives and friends prepared. Matapule Ioane shortened his speech. He wasn't sure if anyone was listening. But those preparing to depart had heard every word, despite the wave of crying. Several ladies moved to uncover the trestle tables laden with food. Barbecued rockod, emperor, trevally, lobster, shark, and breadfruit were laid out in quantity. Glasses of kamai mai, a cordial made from concentrated sweet toddy, was placed in rows on each table. During the meal, Micah the policeman was busy filling in the passenger departure forms for the official police record and for the aircraft pilot.
The secondary school teacher, Sione, and his wife, Mereoni, were at the top of the list. Sione was leaving because there were only six high school students left on Aana. He was moving to Fiji, where he would be employed by the local Institute of Technology. Sione and Mereoni's son, Felipe, at fourteen years of age, would attend secondary school in Suva, Fiji's capital. Next was Laumanu. She had trained as a nurse in New Zealand and was migrating to Auckland to take up a position at the main city hospital. Last on the list was Petuwili. He was the Aana Atoll dentist. After graduating from the Fiji School of Medicine, he returned to his home island to set up private practice. A reducing population through increased emigration made it impossible for him to make a living locally. He joined the Exodus to take up employment in Brisbane, Australia. There was excitement when a young boy called out, It's the seaplane! It's here! Everyone moved outside to watch the spectacular arrival. Brilliant sunlight reflected off the small white and cream seven-passenger seaplane. Its streamlined floats cut through the foaming blue sea. The sleek craft taxied towards the beach in front of the community hall. Micah ran out, dragging a large rectangular orange rubber boarding pontoon. Several children ran to help him while the adults laughed and shook their heads. The pilot left one engine running and emerged from the cabin onto the pontoon with a bag of mail and several large parcels in a string bag. He handed them to Micah and motioned to the passengers to board the aircraft. Turn around had to be quick. The young men and women helpers soon had the baggage in the hold. They steadied the passengers onto the pontoon. Everyone crowded around for the boarding sequence. Micah and the children pulled the pontoon ashore and pushed the plane out to deeper water. The aircraft turned seaward and taxied a few meters. The second engine roared to life. Pilot and passengers waved furiously at those on the beach. The atoll citizens returned the farewell gestures vigorously. With a surge of speed, the seaplane whisked across the tops of the sea swells and lifted into the air. Like a large white bird, the modern flying machine increased altitude till it was high in the bright sky. The atoll people ceased waving and assumed silence. The image of the white bird grew smaller and smaller. Gazing skyward, the islanders felt that a precious portion of lifeblood had been drained from the veins of their atoll homeland. Mm -hmm.